So you want me to set the timer? Uh, no, but do let me know when it's. Uh, yeah, what time do you want me? Twelve forty-five. Give me a signal when it's uh, twelve forty-five. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think I'll notice that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we're looking at Revelation chapter 3. We've been going through the seven letters to the seven churches. And this is now, of course, the uh, fifth of the letters. It is uh, the shortest of the letters, which might mean that I'll speak more briefly about it, but that's, uh, that's nothing anyone should ever count on. Uh, <clears throat> let me uh, read the letter first of all. It's uh, verses 1 through 6 of Revelation 3. And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, and hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed with garments, excuse me, white garments, and I will not blot his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. <clears throat> he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there's not much, uh, not very much length to this, and part of that is because it lacks one of the things that many of the letters have. And that thing that it lacks is a commendation of anything good about the church. Now, of course, we find that three of the letters Jesus has something good and something negative to say about the churches in three cases out of the seven. In two of the cases, he has nothing negative. That would be the church of uh, Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia. But there's also two churches in which he has, uh, he has negative but nothing positive to say. And Sardis is the first of those and Laodicea is the second one. Now, there's no great crimes uh, committed by this church. Um, it doesn't seem to have any heresies. The church, uh, in fact, most of the other churches, uh, the Church of Ephesus, certainly, and the Church of Pergamos and Thyatira, all had heretics that they were dealing with. Now, the Ephesian church was dealing adequately with them, was you know, not tolerating them, and, uh, and, but they had left their first love, so that was a problem for them. The Church of Smyrna, nothing negative had been set up. It's one of the few that nothing, uh, no complaints are raised about. Uh, both Pergamos and Thyatira had heretics uh, who were teaching probably Gnostic antinomianism, it looks like. They were teaching that it was okay for people to commit fornication and to eat meat sacrificed to idols. These two compromises were in both churches. Now, this church doesn't have any false teachers and doesn't have any uh, striking, glaring scandals in the church. It just doesn't have, apparently, what Jesus wants. It's not alive. It has a name for being alive, but it's kind of gone dead. The, the flame has gone out. Um, and this seems to be worse than the Church of Ephesus. The Church of Ephesus had left its first love, but, uh, but wasn't lacking entirely in love. The flame hadn't gone totally out. He said, strengthen, you know, uh, return, repent. And also the Church of Laodicea, we'll see, is lukewarm. Uh, but all of these churches at least no matter how bad they are, have some in them that are not so bad. There's always the promise to those who overcome, and there's actually references to those who are, um, as he puts it, who overcome and walk in white garments. And he has promises to them. So no matter how bad a church gets, it's always got, there's always the hope that a remnant within them may be saved and may even, frankly, uh, revitalize the church. You never know. Now, many churches are bad because they're stuck. Uh, they have the outward tra uh, trappings of being a living organism or organization. 
And they have attendance. They have uh, maybe some excitement going on. They have talent. They've got good sermons. And therefore, they assume, as most people would, that they have you know, church life. They have what Jesus is looking for. And they have a name. This church had a name that they were alive. So there was something about them that gave that appearance or gave them that reputation. But the way Jesus evaluated things, uh, they weren't really alive. They were dead. This is similar to other places in these seven letters that show how Jesus evaluates churches differently than people do. Because in Smyrna, we're told they were poor, but he says, but you're really rich. And in uh, the church of Laodicea, he says, you say, I am rich, but you don't know that you're really poor. Jesus evaluates churches better than churches evaluate themselves, uh, and, and then probably other people evaluate them, although sometimes outsiders can see it more clearly than the churches themselves. Churches keep busy, most of them today, with a lot of activities. They have a lot of outreaches sometimes. They have a lot of uh, ministries and uh, support groups, uh, you know, recovery groups and so forth in some of the big churches. And so they look like they've got, like, they're like a beehive. It looks like it's a really alive and really going places. But where they're really going is cold uh, in terms of their love for Christ. Again, Jesus looks at that, and that is what evaluates a church, not how much activity they have. Most of these churches have a lot of activity going on. Now, Sardis, the town, Sardis had a very long history. Like in the 12th century BC, it was one of the greatest cities in the world, believe it or not. You probably have heard very little of it except from the Bible. But it was the capital of a great kingdom called the Kingdom of Lydia. And uh, had a very famous king at one time, I think in the 8th century BC, Croesus, spelled C-R-O-E-S-U-S. He was uh, very famous for his wealth. In fact, there's a saying in the ancient Greek world, as rich as Croesus. Um, I guess it'd be like saying, as rich as, you know, whoever we think of as the richest person these days, you know. But this was the king, the king of Sardis at, at this far time back. But the city of Sardis had fallen twice unnecessarily to invaders. It was built... Uh, in a river valley, out of which there loomed tall, steep cliffs, mountains. And this mountain range had these different spurs sticking out in different directions with steep walls. And the city was built, the, the original city was built on top of one of these spurs that was acce accessible only from, you know, the, the main mountain out into this area. And it was, it was easy to defend because there's a narrow access. Everything else was sheer cliffs around it so that it was pretty much secure, you know, from invasion. Another city had been built down at the bottom of that mountain, around it, and it was down on the valley, and I suppose that a lot of the business was conducted there since it would be more accessible to merchants and things like that. But the city up on the, up on the hill <clears throat> was pretty inaccessible and pretty secure, and therefore Sardis became kind of soft. They became secure. They, they, they trusted in their, their you know, geography and their uh, natural defenses. But they were uh, attacked in the 6th century BC by Cyrus, the king of the Persians, the one who actually eventually conquered Babylon and released the Jews from captivity. But this same Cyrus and the Persians uh, besieged Sardis. And Sardis was very secure. And they didn't guard their, their city very well. And what happened was, uh, it was really hard to attack. Cyrus didn't have an easy way to do so. But one of his soldiers saw one day, one of the Sardian soldiers at the city <coughs> accidentally dropped his helmet. And, and he saw him climb down the side of the cliff to retrieve it. He thought, well, there must be a crevice there or something there that a man can climb up and down that steep wall. Uh, the, the mountain was made of like pressed, you know, mud and stuff rather than, you know, granite or something, you know. And so there were cracks in it. And so uh, 
the Persians deduced that there was a way to climb up that wall. So at night, uh, they went, some soldiers went up there and they found there's no guard, no guard on the wall. So they just took the city easily uh, because they were over secure, complacent, soft, and uh, vulnerable. But they didn't know they were vulnerable. So they didn't have a watchman. Now, interestingly, the same thing happened to them a few hundred years later, a different generation of Sardians. Uh, eventually, because Persia conquered them, they were reduced from being the great rich city that they were to something much less. Could have been Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great uh, actually elevated them. He actually, <coughs> under Alexander the Great later on, they actually uh, became great again under Greek sort of sponsorship. But Alexander died, and he was replaced by his four generals and so forth, and then there were the the Assyrian uh, set of kings, the Seleucids. One of them was Antiochus, and he attacked. Well, what happened? Antiochus was at war with somebody else, and that that person that Antiochus was chasing fled to Sardis and was being kept there, secure. And so Antiochus attacked Sardis to get this guy out, and had the same thing. Actually, he besieged Sardis for a year until one of his soldiers saw the same kind of thing <laughs> that the Persian soldiers saw. So they, they realized that, that the city could be, you could climb, it's 1,500 feet up. It'd, take a, it'd be a lot of climbing straight up, but still it was a place where there was a vulnerability. And so uh, Antiochus soldiers came at night and climbed there. And once again, there was no guard there. So they just took, they took the city because they were not on watch. Now what's interesting is that Jesus says to Sardis, you need to watch. In fact, twice he says it to them. Uh, he mentions in verse 2, be watchful. And then in verse 3, he says, if you will not watch, I will come on you like a thief. Now, this probably would resonate, in a sense, with the history of that city, since they had fallen twice to invaders because they weren't watching. Now, that, of course, he's talking to the church, not to the city. We have to always remember that. We, when we look at the history of these cities, we're not talking about the history of the church there. Uh, apparently, while Paul was in Ephesus in the book of Acts, it says he stayed there for about three years. And during that three years, all of Asia was evangelized. And that would include Sardis. So probably not Paul himself, but probably one of his lieutenants that he sent out went out to Sardis and, uh, and, and converted the city. Or not converted the city, but converted some people in the city. Some people in the city became converted and started a church there. And it was a church with a reputation of doing well. They appeared to be living, but Jesus, who can see deeper than others, said they were really dead. Now, he introduces himself, as in most of these cases, using imagery from chapter 1, where John saw the vision of Jesus. And in most of these letters, when Jesus introduces himself, he describes himself from things in, in that vision. So that he actually says in verse uh, 1, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. Now, he always says, I know your works. He says that to every one of them. Sometimes what follows is good. Sometimes what follows is bad or both. But he said he has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, both of those are mysterious when you're studying Revelation and you're trying to make sense of some of the imagery, there's, you're, you run into some roadblocks, like the seven stars. In chapter 1, it said that Jesus had the seven stars in his hand. But what are the seven stars? Well, he's told in verse 20, chapter 1, verse 20, it says the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. But what are the seven angels of the seven churches? We've you know, we've kind of speculated about that in some of our earlier cases where we looked at these. Uh, what are the seven angels of the churches? Remember the word angel can mean messenger. In fact, it does mean messenger in Greek. So some people think it's talking about the pastor of the church uh, and the seven pastors are in his hand. The problem with that is we don't have any New Testament evidence that there was such a thing as a pastor in any church in New Testament times. That was a development that came up in the later centuries. In the early church, they had uh, elders multiple elders in each church, and they were given the task to pastor or shepherd the church. So we don't read anywhere in the Bible of any church having a pastor. Now, by the time Revelation was written, maybe some did, 
it almost makes it sound like all these churches had an angel of the church. And, and I have my doubts whether it's really referring to what we call a pastor today. I mentioned the possibility before that the angel of the church could be a person in the church who was literate, and when letters were sent from apostles, that person would read those letters to the church, not only because other people in the church might not be literate, but because they wouldn't have copies. They didn't simply, I mean, that's how people heard these epistles when they were read to them. They, they didn't have copies to read at home. The letter would come to the church and someone would read it to the congregation. And so maybe the angel, the messenger of the church, is somebody who's designated to, to read the letters to the churches. Not what we call a pastor, just somebody who can read and, and would read to the churches. Uh, there's other possibilities. Of course, we could be thinking of angels in the, in the more common sense that we think of angels, guardian angels or whatever. The problem with seeing the seven angels as guardian angels or as supernatural angels from heaven is that we have Jesus sending a message to the church, addressing it to the angel. Uh, and again, John is writing a letter, therefore, to the angel of the church. If he's writing to a, what we call an angel, you know, a guardian angel, uh, where does he post that letter to? You know, how do you, how do you get a, a letter to an angel? And for that matter, why does Jesus need to send letters to angels? Doesn't he have more direct communication with them? Does he have to write, have an apostle write a letter to an angel? That, that consideration makes it seriously problematic to see the angels as, you know, heavenly angels. Also, the angel is spoken to as if he is responsible. It's, you know, it, all these things are addressed to the angel, which including repent, and I have these things against you, and so forth. So it'd be hard to believe that a holy angel in heaven is making these mistakes. So it's probable, uh, although not certain, that there is somebody in the church who is reading the letter to the church, and it's not just that reader, but the church is, that's hearing the letter also receives the rebuke. In any case, the seven stars are the seven angels. But what are the seven spirits of God? That's a deeper problem than the seven stars because we're never told, we're never told what they actually are. They are seen before the throne in chapter 4, and other things are said about them that don't necessarily help us much. For example, in chapter 5, verse 6, it says when he saw Jesus for the first time in the book, he saw a lamb as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So the seven eyes on the lamb, which no doubt speaks of his omniscience, uh, they are the seven spirits, supposedly, well, whatever that means. The main, the main theory among uh, commentators seems to be that the seven spirits just refers to the Holy Spirit. Uh, why he would be called seven spirits is not known, except there is a possibility that what's implied here is that the Holy Spirit has his own manifestation in each congregation. Not every congregation has exactly the same spiritual dynamics. But the Holy Spirit works differently, manifests differently in different congregations. So the seven spirits could be, again, the, 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 the Holy Spirit in his working in each church. This does not satisfy me very much, but I've never found a, an answer to the question that does. I don't think anybody really can say. So he introduces himself that way, but it does make it very clear that he's assessing the spiritual nature of the seven churches. He has the seven spirits, and this Certainly the, the number seven is associated with the seven stars and the seven lampstands, which are the seven churches. So he, he's basically looking at the spiritual condition of the church, not just outward circumstances. When he wrote to Pergamos or to Thyatira, he could, you don't even need a lot of spiritual discernment to see, hey, they got people preaching you can commit fornication here. You know, that's, that's heresy, you know. Uh, but in a church like this, it's got the appearance to all visible, you know, onlookers. Um, has the appearance of being alive. But she said, eh, not really. You're not really alive. Sorry about that. You're really dead. And he says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. So he says you're dead, but he really means almost dead. That's often the way the word dead is used in the Bible, that a person is nearly dead, as good as dead. They're not really fully dead yet. And uh, frankly, it's that usage of the word dead in the Bible that confuses some people uh, on the doctrine of uh, total depravity, for example. And Paul says we're dead in trespasses and sins. Well, if you're dead, then you can't even breathe, you know? Well, he doesn't mean bread, dead like that. But it's like when it says in 
um, Romans 4, that Abraham, his faith was such that he did not consider, when God said he'd have a multitude of children, he did not consider his own body now dead, it says, nor the deadness of Sarah's womb. It says in Romans 4 that, Paul's, uh, that Abraham's body was dead when God made the promise to him, but Abraham didn't consider that. Now, the same information is given in Hebrews chapter 11, where it says, from one man and him as good as dead came as many as the stars of the, sand of the heavens and the sand of the seashore. There was the same information about Abraham in Hebrews says he was as good as dead. But Romans just says he was dead. But of course, he wasn't dead when God made the promise to him. So dead is sometimes used as, you know, you're as good as dead. I mean, almost there. It's like you said, wow, we're all dead men here because we just heard that North Korea's lobbed a, a nuke, you know, and ground center is Temecula, you know, <laughs> ground zero is Temecula. Uh, so, well, we're dead. Well, not quite yet, but give it a few minutes, you know, and we will be. So obviously he says it's, there are things that are ready to die. It's, the church is considered to be essentially a dead church, but not everything about it is dead. He says, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Now, he says, I, he earlier said, I know your works. And he doesn't say anything about their works. He talks about their name and their condition. But I know your works. Obviously, their name and their condition must somehow be revealed in their works, but he doesn't say what their works are. Uh, he just complains their works are not perfect. Now, the word, the word perfect, of course, in the Greek means complete. And therefore... It might mean that they, there should be more works. They should be doing more of the right kind of works, and the, the number they've done is not a, not a complete number that they should have done. Or it could mean their works are not completely or thoroughly um, motivated rightly. When Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven, in Matthew 5. If, how, can your, how can your righteous deeds exceed those of the scribes and Pharisees? They, they were like full-time righteous deed doers, you know. But unless, you're, unless you exceed that, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Obviously, it's not the quantity of the deeds that's the problem with the Pharisees. They're doing a lot of stuff that looks good. It's the, it's the quality. It's the, it's the motivation in them. Like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, I could, you know, bestow all my goods on the, to feed the poor and give my body to be burned. But if I don't have love, it profits me nothing. It's nothing. I, it's a good work. I mean, giving all your money to the poor, that certainly sounds like a good work. Dying as a martyr for Jesus, that certainly sounds commendable. But if I don't do it for love, it's, it's not only inadequate, it's nothing. It doesn't even register. If anything we do is not of love, then... We may be doing the kinds of things that people do when they are motivated by love, but we're doing the same things without that motivation. That's why Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We, uh, you know, we uh, cast out demons in your name. We did mighty works in your name. They'll say, I never knew you. Well, they, but they were doing all these cool things. Things that I'd like to do some of those things. Well, I'd like to do more mighty works. I haven't done any mighty works in his name. I haven't cast out very many demons in my time either, nor prophesied. But they were doing all that stuff. Those are, those are Christian activities. But he introduced it by saying, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father in heaven. In other words, you're doing all kinds of things that are noticeable. Certainly, if you had those things going on in your church, you'd be called a living church. Wow, this church is really alive. Look at these exorcisms. Look at these mighty deeds. Look at these prophecies every service. And you say, yeah, I never knew you. Don't even know you people. That's there's something wrong with your works. They're not perfect before God, he says. And what makes perfect works is perfect love. Uh, and so, and and having perfect love be the motivation for your works. The reason you do it is not because you want to have a reputation of being spiritual or or having being a great church. You do it because you really are sacrificially committed to the well-being of other people and not yourself. Now, this kind of imperfect works, the ones that look good but aren't motivated right, can happen in any relationship. Certainly, they happen in churches all the time, I'm sure. 
I mean, not every church all the time, but they, I'm sure you can find it at any given time in churches. Uh, it happens in marriages or in any kind of business or relationships. The, the kind things, the, the servant things you do for another person, if it's not because you're placing them literally above yourself in your own estimation, uh, then it's not love. It's not because you want them to remember that you did something good and therefore like you. Um, it's because you know they'll be blessed. It'll be good for them. And that's what motivates you. It's the desire to do good for others, regardless of whether you get, you know, noticed or credit or whatever. That's This church apparently was like that because they didn't have the life motivating their works. They were dead, in his opinion. He says, remember, therefore, now. Oh, no, remember how <laughs> you have received and heard. Now, he doesn't say what they received and heard, but how they received and heard. Interesting. He doesn't say what it was that they had received and heard. We have to assume he's talking about the gospel and Christ, when you received Christ, and how you first heard of Christ. Remember that? Remember how that motivated you in the beginning when you heard and received Christ? How central his will was to your life? How motivated you were to do what pleases him and others and to serve others to please him uh remember those days a lot of times i think churches forget those days a lot of times in those days the church was kind of struggling and small and unimpressive most churches that are really big didn't start out really big some did some started out pretty big and got bigger but a lot of churches for example, a lot, of, a lot of the big churches in this area started out as home groups and the present pastors were just leading a home Bible study in their home and they got into a big church. So, and once the church becomes big, things get complicated. Then you've got employees, then you've got a building, you've got administration, you've got organization, you've got staff problems. You've got all kinds of things that you didn't have at the beginning. And I'm not saying that those problems are not worth having. But a lot of times when a church begins to be that complicated, it's getting a lot of things done. And it's considered to be a very successful church. In fact, the pastors of those big churches are the ones that all the pastors of small churches kind of look up to. They're the ones who bring these guys to the church growth conferences to tell other, you know, Struggling pastors, how to get it done and get a big church like that. Well, they, they have a name that they live. But a lot of times, it's like the Church of Ephesus. Uh, you know, they've left their first love. They don't know it. It's not like they don't love Jesus. It's just that it, they're not doing everything for the love of Jesus. They're doing a lot of things just to keep the machine oiled and, and moving. You know, it's a big organization. And you need to remember how it was when you first heard and received Christ, how it was in the early days, how simple it was, how the honeymoon was, you know, with Jesus. Uh, and kind of remember, that's, that's what he's interested in. He's not interested in all the big reputation of a big church. He's interested in the purity of their hearts and the motivation of their works. And he says, Re remember that stuff, how you've received and heard and hold fast and repent. Now, hold fast to what you had at the beginning and repent of all the extraneous things that, that have made you look busy, made you look like a big successful church, but really, you know, are deceiving the world and maybe even deceiving yourselves. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come upon you. Now we have to ask, what does it mean to watch? You know, he told them to be watchful in verse 2 and, and to watch in verse 3, but what, what are you watching for? Uh, are, are, are we watching for Jesus? We need what, we get a telescope and kind of aim it in the direction we hope he might come so we'll see him. What are we, how do you watch for Jesus? Obviously, the word watch is used quite a bit in the New Testament as when Jesus told his disciples, watch and pray when they were in the 
Garden of Gethsemane. He was going to pray for an hour. He says, pray with me for an hour and watch. And when they fell asleep, he said, couldn't you watch with me for an hour? The word watch in such cases literally means stay awake. Watching and fasting are two disciplines that Paul kind of mentions together sometimes. Fasting, you abstain from food. Watching, you abstain from sleep. Sometimes you do both to pray. You watch and pray, you fast and pray. That is, you're, you're giving your prayers such priorities that you lose sleep to devote to that. You'll miss meals to devote to that. That you're actually putting prayer ahead of such refreshment and even human needs as eating and sleeping. Watching means to stay awake. And yet, of course, in this case, it's talking about a watchman. Now, watchmen have to stay awake too, but to be on watch doesn't simply mean to stay awake. It means to pay attention, to, to pay attention to what's going on, to be attentive to danger, for example. In Matthew chapter 20, uh, 23, we have Jesus first using this imagery of someone watching and of a thief, Jesus coming like a thief. Those are images that are brought up in this statement that he makes to the church of Sardis. The, uh, the background for these statements starts in uh, <clears throat> chapter 23. Or no, I'm sorry, it's not 23, it's 24. And in verse 42, <clears throat> he says, Watch therefore, for you do not know at what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. It means he would have stayed away. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. And then he says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, finds so doing. Assuredly, I say to you, that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master delays his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that servant will come in a day when he's not looking for him and at an hour that he's not aware of and will cut him in two. That's pretty severe. And appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. Therefore, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this is about how the servants of God are supposed to occupy themselves awaiting his coming. He says, watch, stay awake. Like a, like a homeowner, if he, if he had some forewarning, uh, that, you know, these guys, I overheard these guys, they're going to come break into your house at three in the morning, uh, just so I'd let you know. Well, that homeowner is going to either set an alarm or he's going to wake up and stay awake, at least till three in the morning. He's going to, if he knows the thief's coming, he'll stay awake to be ready for him. Now, we can't literally stay awake until Jesus comes back. I mean, that's not literally, you know, what we're to do. That is staying awake in the sense of never catching any sleep. We die very quickly or go crazy. So what does it mean then to, to stay awake? Uh, we're watching for Jesus. Well, it certainly means to be att paying attention. That we're not slumbering. We're not drifting off into inattention, but we're paying attention because he says that the Lord's going to come at an hour when you do not expect him. He says that in verse 44. Now, he does talk about the servant that, that is not prepared when his master comes. That's the guy who says, you know, my master is not coming anytime soon, so I guess I'll just party on. And he begins to eat and drink with the drunkards and abuse his fellow servants. And he says, the Lord of that servant will come to him at a time when he's not aware of it. Well, he just says none of us are going to be aware of it, whether we're, whether we're eating and drinking with the drunkards or whether we're praying and fasting. We're not going to know when he's going. He just said that in verse 44, the Son of Man will come at a time you won't expect him. So, but the problem is for the guy who's eating and drinking with the drunkards, he doesn't expect Jesus back either, but he's by no means ready. He's by no means in a condition. You know, if the thief comes... Yeah, I, I don't know what, what you're supposed to do about that. 
Uh, I mean, if you have to go to sleep and thieves might come when you don't know it, and a thief might come at any time, I guess you just have to be ready at, at the alert. Uh, you know, remember the 10 <coughs> bridesmaids? 10 virgins, as they're called in the King James Version, in Matthew 25, just a couple, a little over from the page. They all went out to meet the bridegroom, and he didn't come for a while, so they all fell asleep. Now, none of them are faulted for falling asleep. People do that when the night gets late. They eventually fall asleep. But when the sound went up, the bridegroom comes, then they woke up. And five of them were prepared. They had made preparations, and they maintained preparations. They brought extra oil because that meant they knew that there might be a bit of a wait. The others had not brought extra oil, which means they were not prepared for a long wait. But the ones who had the extra oil, when they woke up, they saw, uh, you know, they're ready for their duties. They're ready to meet the bridegroom. Now, the church then has to be at all times ready, even if we, even if we fall asleep, I mean, literally fall asleep at night, we have to be ready, just like a person would be ready to pop out of bed if, if he heard a thief rattling the door or breaking a window. You'd jump out of bed. You'd be awake real quick. And you need to be, in a sense, prepared for that contingency if you live in a place where thieves can get to, which most people do. And likewise, we don't know when Jesus is going to come back. Now, therefore, we have to be always living every moment as if you know we may be awakened to that reality of, of the Lord's coming, you know, the master's returning, the bridegroom comes, that we suddenly are bolted awake and we're, and we're, we're exact, exactly prepared as we should be. Now, falling asleep spiritually, of course, we shouldn't ever fall asleep spiritually. When we compare the physical act of falling asleep, we have to talk about that's inevitable. You're going to fall asleep and wake up. But spiritually falling asleep means that you're, in a sense, you're always ready. I mean, whether you're physically asleep or awake, you have always have to be ready. You should be doing at any given time what you would want to be doing if this was your last moment. Because frankly, if Jesus doesn't come back today, obviously that doesn't mean you're going to live through the day. Any of us may meet Jesus today, and that's a very realistic possibility at any given day. So obviously every day should be lived as if the thief may come now. Jesus said, you don't know. He's going to come when you're not expecting him. But no problem if you're ready. If you're not beating your fellow servants and eating your drinking with the drunkards, uh, you're okay when he comes. He says, blessed is that servant who, when he comes, the master finds him giving food to his brother, which he was appointed to do. The idea is to stay on your watch, stay at your task, stay on the project, and don't, you know, don't become weary. Uh, and don't stop. Remember Jesus in one place, it says, uh, and that was, uh, it was Luke 18. It says that Jesus told a parable to teach the disciples that men ought always to pray and not faint. It says in the King James, not lose heart, I think modern ones say. But you can lose heart. You can become weary of well-doing. Paul says don't become weary of well-doing because the Lord delays. And if he delays... You sometimes get your guard down. You know, it's like, like Sardis. When they had, you know, they probably at one point had watchmen on the walls. But eventually, no one ever came. No one ever came up that back route. No one ever climbed that crevice. You know, I guess, uh, I guess that's not going to happen. We don't need to watch there. Uh, and it was their failure to be alert to the possibility it could happen at any time that, that they fell twice. Now, He's simply saying you need to get your works to what they should be. You need to repent of your works not being perfect. And you need to maintain them. That's, that's staying awake. That's being prepared for the thief. Now, when he says, if you do not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. Now, Jesus comes like a thief, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. He's going to come upon us like a thief, too. He'll come at an hour we don't expect him. The difference is, if we're ready, we're not threatened. I mean, if you if you're sitting, if the thief comes through the window and you're sitting in the room with your your twelve gauge sitting across your lap, it's uh you know. So the thief came when you you know, but you're ready for him. Uh, but <laughs> but if you're not ready for him, then it's a threat. The coming of a thief is a is a real threat to someone who, in no sense, was expecting him or prepared for him. And uh, if you haven't kept your powder dry, 
you know, then then it's going to be a bad situation when the thief shows up unexpected. If you, uh, I mean, I hate to use imagery of, of guns and things like that, but that's how many homeowners are prepared for a break-in. <coughs> you know, if if you've got your 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 protection right there, and someone breaks in, you're you're ready for them. Big and, problem. Yeah, <laughs> but if someone's not ready, and he comes as a thief, that's that's not a good thing. Thieves are can be a real threat to people who are unprepared to meet them. And he says, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Now, I, he, he will come to them. Interestingly, this is not a reference to his second coming. How do I know that? Because that city, frankly, the church isn't there anymore. There's no church in Sardis. The church itself has been a ruin for 200 years. There's no church there. He's not telling the church of Sardis that he's going to come to them in that sense. But he could come to them in the sense that he comes to nations often referred to in the scripture uh, that God comes to Egypt. That is when the Assyrians come to Egypt and wipe them out. That's God's judgment on them. That's God coming to punish them. Same thing when he comes to Babylon or when he comes to Edom or when he comes to any of these nations, the Bible says, you know, he does so through armies. Uh, these people have been defeated by armies before. The city had been. But they are in danger of being wiped out as a church if, they're, if they remain dead or close to death. They're supposed to strengthen the things that are ready to die. You know, they need to wake up and realize they're, they're in a dangerous situation which they did not have any sense for because they had a name for being alive. You know, there are churches that know they're in trouble. They know they're falling apart. They know that they're they're rampant with carnality and sin and that there's hardly any justification for them existing as a church anymore. But this wasn't one of them. These were people who had a reputation of being a living church. And uh, he says, now you've got to realize it's about ready to die. And you need to wake up, be watchful, get attentive, uh, start doing those things, strengthening those things in the church that make it ready in case Jesus happens to show up. Not necessarily in his second coming. Of course, he, in our day, I don't see any reason why we couldn't think his second coming could come any moment. But in those days, uh, obviously that church wasn't going to live long enough anyway to see the second coming. He said, if you don't wake up, if you don't watch, I'm going to come to you. If they had watched, they might be here to this day and they might be here to see the second coming. But he's saying, I'm no, I'm going to come to you if you don't watch. You're going, to, you're going to be wiped out. You're going to be destroyed as a church if you don't attend to these deficiencies. Uh, Chauncey. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so he says, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. Now, white garments, that's the color of garment that Jesus was wearing in the vision in chapter one. That's the color of the garments that are given to the martyrs who are under the altar in chapter 6 when the fifth seal is broken John sees the martyrs under the altar and they're saying how long before you avenge our blood and he gives them white robes and tells them to wait a little longer what are these white garments well probably they refer to <coughs> purity and innocence uh, the bride at the end of Revelation in chapter 19 is given fine linen, pure and white, her wedding dress. And it says the white linen, the fine linen, is the righteous acts of the saints. So the white linen of the church, of the bride, in chapter 19, actually is stated to be their good deeds, which means they're well behaved. It means that they've, they've pleased God by the way they act. And he says that's, you know, there will be some, there are some in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. They're white. They are, their garments are white. Uh, they are doing good deeds. They are doing what they should do as followers of Christ. And he says, uh, you know, they have not defiled their garments. James said, as you may remember, uh, pure religion and undefiled, but where God is to uh, visit widows and orphans and to keep oneself unspotted or unstained from the world. <clears throat> So these people have been un, uh, uncompromised. And he says there's a few names. It's interesting, he didn't say there's a few people. He said there's a few names. It points out that Jesus, we, we would know this anyway, but it's just an interesting uh, 
emphasis. And he knows the people in church by name. He, know, he doesn't just know there's a church down there and there's some people down there who are doing some things. He knows the names of the people. He knows the names of the ones who are not defiling themselves. He knows them personally. It's a personal relationship he has with these people. And he says, they'll, uh, they'll walk in white garments and I'll not blot that person's name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Now that last line, of course, comes from Jesus' instructions he gave to the disciples in Matthew 10 when he sent them out two by two, the 12, and he t said, you know, don't be ashamed of me. Whoever denies me before men, I'll deny before my Father in heaven. Whoever confesses me before men, I'll confess him before my Father. Now, the whole church was, in fact, confessing Jesus verbally. I mean, they were a Christian church. They confessed that Jesus was Lord. All churches confess that. But not all of them do it with their lives. Not all of them do it other than in words. And, you know, there's a statement that Paul makes in Titus chapter 1, talking about certain people that are going the wrong way in the church. He says in verse 16, Titus 1, 16, they profess to know God, but in their works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Their works deny him. Their mouths, with their mouths, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their behavior. Which do you suppose makes the most difference? Uh, you know? <clears throat> and so Jesus says, uh, those people, I will confess that person's name. Who? The person who walks in white garments with him, who, who is undefiled. Now he says, I will not blot his name out from the book of life. This is really the last thing we need to talk about here. The book of life and one's name being in the book of life is a very... difficult concept. On the one hand, he says here that it's possible to have one's name blotted out of the book of life. He doesn't actually say it's possible, but he implies it's possible. He says, I won't. If, you, if you're an overcomer, I won't blot your name out of the book of life. Now, some people say, well, that's just because it can't be. You know, If you're an overcomer, you're one of the elect, and the elect can't lose their salvation, so there's no way their, life, their, their name could be blotted out. Well, but this seems to be a special promise to those who overcome that, that they won't be blotted out as if it could happen. Now, in the last verses of Revelation, in some manuscripts, now this reads differently in different manuscripts, but in Revelation twenty two nineteen, 19, Jesus said, if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life. Now, that's in the King James and the New King James. Actually, other manuscripts say from the tree of life, which is a different idea altogether. But, but there are some manuscripts where it says, I'll take him, you know, his part will be taken away from the book of life. Maybe that's the original. Who knows? In any case, there are those who will not have their names removed, but perhaps could if they didn't become overcomers. Now, an overcomer is not just someone who got saved. An overcomer is somebody who stays saved. A person who endures to the end. A person who overcomes Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and does not love their life unto death. That's what it says that overcomers are. So one who remains faithful unto death, their name is secure in the book of life. Now, the question I said it's confusing about the book of life is that there are references in, in Revelation 13.8 and in Revelation 17.8 to those whose names were written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And so what is this book of life? Is it, the, is it the book of the saved? It seems to be the book of the saved because it says in Revelation, 15, uh, Revelation 20 and verse 15, as many as were not found in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. So the book of life apparently contains the names of people who are not thrown into the lake of fire and therefore the names of the saved. Some people think that everybody's name is written in the book of life from birth. And then they're struck from the book of life as they turn from God or whatever. Uh, others believe that the book of life was blank at the beginning. And then as people become God's people, he puts their names in. Moses talked about God's book. David talked about God's book and their names being in it. But uh, there's no explanation. Is this a book of the living in, that is to say, those physically alive in the Old Testament? When Moses said, you know, if you won't forgive these people, then blot my name out of your book. 
Was he asking, you know, to be killed merely? Or was he saying, you know, I don't want to be saved? You know, that, that's, that'd be a strange thing. It's a very hard thing to know. But one thing is stated. If someone says, can you lose your salvation? And then they want to argue with you about that. I think, I mean, obviously you can argue that issue. But from this verse, what it actually says is, it answers the question, can you keep your salvation? Can you, can you be secure? Can your salvation be secure? Yes. Your name will not be blotted out of the book of life if you are an overcomer. It's like uh, there, big, there was a big controversy in the church back in the uh, 70s about whether Christians could have demons. And some said yes and some said no. And Jack Hayford, a pastor of a church, a uh, four-score church up in uh, Van Nuys, put out a lecture. He had a lecture called, Can a Christian Have a Freedom? Not, Can a Christian Have a Demon? The real question is, can a Christian be free from demons? I, I, someone asked me once on the air, can a Christian have a demon? I think, why would they want one? Why would anyone want one? You know? The question is not, can I have a demon? That's like saying, can I backslide and still be saved? That's not the question you should be asking. The question is, can I be free from demons? Can I be secure in my salvation? And, and what this passage addresses is that point. Yes, you can, if you're an overcomer. Those who remain faithful unto death, uh, those who love not their lives to death, they're the overcomers, and they will not have their names blotted out of the book of life. also talks about that statement that Paul made, about the, the good statement he made concerning if we... Are you talking about uh, 1 Corinthians 9 where he said that he didn't want to be... No, it's the one he talks about, the, the um, one he talks about, he who... Um, the good statement Paul made, as opposed to all the bad ones he made. <laughs> <laughs> if we, if we, if we, uh, if we acknowledge Christ, He will acknowledge us before the. Lord. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Second Timothy two. That's yeah. that's a that's a good one too, on this point. Second Timothy two, Paul said, oh, "What you call the good statement? He said the faithful statement. The faithful. That's what you meant. Yeah, the good statement. Yeah, uh, yeah. In Second uh, Timothy chapter two. Verse uh, 11 through 13, Paul says, This is a faithful saying. If we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Now, a lot of people take that last line as a statement that, hey, if we deny, if we're faithless, it doesn't matter. God's still faithful, so we'll still be saved. No. It says he can't deny himself. If, if we deny him, he'll deny us. He is faithful means he's trustworthy. When he says this is a faithful saying. Now this is a faithful saying. It's true. He is faithful. You can trust what he says. He says if you deny him, he'll deny you. That's a faithful saying. You may not believe it, he but said, he's, it's still true. The way you said it was, he's faithful to his threats and promises. He's faithful to his promises and his threats. Yeah. And while it says he cannot deny himself, it specifically says he can deny us if we deny him. So, anyway, yeah, we could get into a long Bible study on all the passages that show that you can lose your salvation. I believe there are lots of verses that cannot be argued around uh, on that point. But when people, when people want to argue that point, I think, isn't that really a backslider's concern? Or often the mother of the backslider is the one who's concerned about it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in other words, somebody has to be backslidden in order for that to become an issue. That's abnormal. Backsliding is not an option. Why would we be considering that? Why would anyone consider, can I lose my salvation? What, are you thinking about it? You, you, you maybe going to take, take your chances? That's not the way a Christian thinks. You know, the question is, can I be faithful unto death? That's that's the goal. That's that's some, the only question I need to be asking. Some would say you can't be unborn. Right. Born again. Right. When I was, uh, I remember very clearly. I was talking to. It was actually John Wickham I was talking to once uh, back in the early seventies. I actually made that point because I was kind of a eternal security guy as a Baptist when I first got into Calvary Chapel, and uh, and I remember saying to John because he was saying something opposite. Now he might say the reverse today. I don't know what he would say today, but I remember when he was a teenager. 
Uh, I said, well, how could a person be unborn again? He said, well, they can commit suicide. <laughs> and that's true. People, just because someone's born doesn't mean they can't kill themselves. And, but, and, and they, they forfeit what God gave them, the life God gave them. But, um, but again, there's, there's arguments that people raise on both sides. It's a very comp complicated question. Uh, certainly got a lot of verses that people use to say you can't possibly lose your salvation. And other verses that seem to say the opposite. But again, even if someone has not resolved that question for themselves, the question is, can I be faithful unto death? If so, I know. I won't. It, the promise is, I won't have my name blood out of the book of life. I will, you know, if, if we confess him and, and follow him, if we endure, we'll reign with him. That's the promise. So I think when people are thinking about maybe backsliding, then they want to know, well, what will, the, what will the ramifications be for me? But that shouldn't be going there. That's falling asleep, you know, at, at the watch. I think a lot of times when people ask, they're just they're concerned about somebody. A lot of times, Christians, like I said, other Christians, a lot of times it's the mother of the backslider who wants, yeah. you know, who wants to believe in eternal security. Yeah. Right. So, um, like I said, that was a short letter. Didn't have as much in it as the others. Had some interesting points in it. All right, I'm going to turn this off. Do you have any?